Let's talk Kansas Jayhawks football on the Our Lads Football Network. I'm, I've never said that before. Uh, Jordan Gusky joining us, uh, covering Kansas football from the Topeka Capital Journal, cjonline.com. That's where you can find all the content for Kansas Jayhawks athletics and, of course, Jordan's work. Jordan, thanks for talking to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, uh, have you been getting a barrage of uh, interest now uh, over the past uh, several weeks that you never thought you'd get? <laughs> I don't know about never thought, but I think it definitely came a lot um, sooner than, than I and, and I'm sure a lot of others expected. Yeah, uh, Lance Leipold just done wonders at Buffalo and now here uh, already in year two at Kansas, so much so that the inevitable talk. Uh, about well okay i guess he's gonna leave N now that he's a uh, success uh he's gonna go to a bigger school with a more traditional football program like nebraska uh we I, look as a as a as a football traditional fan and and, and i've been a, a fan for many more years than you because you're almost half my age fact is this is i love this uh, this is great for college football and i hope he doesn't leave i'm sure the Kansas jayhawk fans uh feel a lot more intensely about that than i do what what do you think what's uh what, what's the latest and because i know he's just gonna say i'm not going anywhere but how do they keep him there how, what's what's going on behind the scenes to make sure he doesn't leave yeah i, I think it's just working out something not not just for him but i would thank his ex assistance as well um, cause you know, I don't know if, you know, we can debate if Kansas can measure up to Wisconsin or Nebraska in terms of how much they're going to invest. Maybe Kansas will, they're definitely trying to up what they're going to do. They're going to do something with the stadiums, the facility. Now, if that measures up to what Wisconsin and Nebraska can do, I guess we'll see. Um, but I think the point is at least doing something that is, is respectable and shows that this program is moving in a direction that is worth sticking with. Uh, not just because of success on the field, but because of the success that, you know, is potentially going to be seen off of it. So just being respectful in terms of what you can offer alongside what, you know, if Wisconsin and Nebraska do try to come calling, what they might try to offer him as assistant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's, uh, you know, any, any good football coach is going to want that. Uh, if he's going to stay there long term, it's not just about money, but he knows he's, if he's going to have success there, he's got to have the right facilities. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I hope that's the case because we all know it's a basketball school first, but that's a good thing in a way because there's so much popularity and money coming into the program because of the basketball program that if, 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 if there's any bit of success at all with the football program, that has to, you would hope to be a big deal for, for, for the university. And, uh, but you know, do you think, do you feel confident that they're going to do what it takes? Yeah. Uh, well, I think they're going to do what they can. And I guess a matter of whether or not it's what it takes, we'll yeah. see, but Lance is saying all, all the right things so far, as much as you can expect them to say, and who knows if Nebraska and Wisconsin even can calling, I'm sure even if let's say tomorrow, Kansas announced, you know, big contract extension and all this stuff, I'm sure people would still be saying, yeah, but let's see buyout. what Nebraska, yeah, sure. yeah, let's see what, let's see what they do. Cause the buyout right now, unless something, has been re reworked recently. I think it's only five million, which for a school like Nebraska or, or Wisconsin isn't going to be doing a whole lot to stop. Yeah, uh, I could see Nebraska more myself. Wisconsin, I'd be surprised if they don't give Leonard the job. Uh, yeah, that's what it seems like people are yeah. saying. I mean, to me, I think that's the reason he stayed there the whole time because he could have probably got a job two or three years ago somewhere else. So, right. Okay, uh, let's talk about the team because this has been a fantastic season. Uh, I've, uh, they've made me look really good as a handicapper on my shows. So I appreciate right. that. Uh, but it all, again, let's talk about the players. Jalen Daniels, a quarterback is really leading this offense, which uh, ranks what 12th in the nation in scoring at this point in time. Didn't look so good last week against Iowa state, but that's because Iowa state is a really good defense. So let's talk about Daniels though. It all starts at the quarterback position and he's still a young kid, even though it's his third year, he has a few, several more years of eligibility left. So what makes him a special player? Yeah, I think first off, it's his leadership and just not just in the pocket, but just around the program. Like if you were trying to, you know, mold what you think a D1 quarterback, at the power five level should be, you know, look like, act like it is Jalen Daniels. Like that's that's what you would want in a leader and a person. And then on top of that, he can make the throws you want him to make. And he's so just, you know, I'm forgetting the word I want to use, but just, you know, 
just instinctive, just really creative and, and good in the running game. To the fact that he's, I guess, I think he actually has the most rushing yards on the team right now. The second most attempts for the most rushing yards. They can use him in that game. And that just creates such a, a dangerous, you know, play action game that they've used time to time. Uh, like if you saw the Houston game where they had the 60 yard touchdown pass to Tory Lachlan, that's a perfect example of the multiplicity that they can use with their formations. And at the heart of that is Jalen Davis. Yeah. Because uh, when I looked at it, you see, uh, you know, all right, your quarterback and he's got 11 touchdowns to one interception. It's a beautiful ratio. You need to do that. You add in, like you said, 329 yards rushing with five touchdowns. His completion percentage is 68%. So that's excellent. But then you take a look at the skill position players, and it's not so they're not at that level yet because they haven't been able to recruit the way I'm sure that they will potentially get to now that they're starting to win. But Devin Neal and Daniel Hinshaw, I mean, it's a good one-two punch when you throw in the additional 300 plus yards from Daniels because Neal's got over 300 yards, Hinshaw's got close to 300 yards rushing. They combined for nine touchdowns on the ground. Which one of the is it? A, is it a, basically a committee with those two, and obviously the three a quarterback? Or is one of those two running backs, uh, you know, a step above? Uh, I think from from my personal look right now, Devin has been at least in the running backs. Devin has been more the step above, but Daniel was sort of helping give that one-two punch a lot more strength than maybe it would have if Daniel wasn't there. The issue is that Daniel has suffered what is likely a season-ending uh-huh. injury uh, against Iowa state. So he's not going to be at least for an extended period of time, not in the picture, but then that goes to, you were mentioning recruiting over the off season. They brought in a transfer from Nebraska a transfer from Minnesota, actually Minnesota's leading rusher transferred to, to Kansas over the off season. It's been hurt the last couple of weeks, but I know people have been talking about the depth of that running back room. So now that Daniel's out, this is going to test it. Okay. Is Kai, is the guy from Minnesota can be able to step up. Is it going to be Savion Morrison, the guy from Nebraska? I mentioned Tory Lachlan, although I would sort of move to, Sevian and Kai before I moved to Tory, if, if we were going to guess there. But yeah, I think what that running back room was able to do with the one two punch that it had uh, certainly helped uh, allow a wide receiver core that doesn't necessarily have a number one guy in that yeah. sense be a lot more dangerous because you have to worry so much about the run and then you have no idea where the ball is going in the air because they have so many different guys out there the ball. Yeah, because that's what I was going to say. I mean, Luke Grimm, even though he's the number one receiver on the team, I think he only averages slightly over 10 yards of reception. So that's not going to scare opposing defenses. Arnold's next at 14, and then no one else has double digits. So like you said, and and Grimm's got two touchdowns. I I believe he leads the team. And when you throw 11 touchdown passes, that's distribution, like you said. So you don't know where the ball's going. So that's a good – that's obviously a good thing, but in time – uh, as long as uh, Lance is there, he's going to eventually start to uh, bring in more elite players that will definitely be the number one guys and we'll be able to notice them more. Uh, so overall, how's the offensive line? Because when you run a pretty good offense, the offensive line must be doing a good job as well. Yeah, they're doing a, a really good job. I think the question, you know, the, you know, the month heading in really the, the months heading into camp. And then, you know, as, as the season got started was not necessarily how the, first five, six, seven guys are going to do. It's the depth behind it. Uh, and I guess we haven't necessarily needed to see that depth test, <clears throat> excuse me, tested yet, but that those those starters are doing really well. Clearly, Jan- Jalen didn't get sacked, I think, until Duke, I think. Um, and then I think he got sacked once more against Iowa State. So they're keeping him up. He's not getting sacked a whole lot. And that, I guess, you know, you have to put in Jalen's mobility that helps out there, but they're obviously doing a lot in the running game. The tight ends do a great job in that as well. Yeah, but the the offensive line's doing a great job, and that includes a transfer from one of the lower levels of college football, Pooney, uh, at left guard, who's also you know stepped up really well in his first year at the FBS level. Is there a, a, a one particular player on the offensive line that is above the rest? I don't know if I'd say above the rest, but Mike Nowitzki, the center, is just really reliable. Uh, I'm not sure he's had a penalty or given up a sack since he's come to Kansas. Oh, wow. Maybe he has okay. it's like one. So like he's, he's, he's really good at what he does. Really reliable. And he's a transfer from Buffalo too. that Lance brought from Buffalo. So a guy who has made that transition to the power five level very well. Now you were talking about assistance and, uh, and I know that uh, when the talk came out about a week or two ago, Lance talked about his offensive coordinator. And I had never heard of the guy other than just reading about him, who the assistants and so forth and so on. Um, how, how, because when you, and I know he's been with Lance for a while. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't know these backstories with the assistants and we know the head coach is always the primary guy, but how good are his assistants, especially if they've been tagging along for a while. 
tell us about, I mean, is, is, is this specific offensive coordinator they have, is he somebody that you believe will probably be gone soon if he doesn't get a raise, that kind of thing? I, I would I would lean yes if he hadn't spent so much time with Lance, like you're mentioning, because so much of what Lance and that stuff does is about, you know, you hear the word alignment thrown around a whole lot in college athletics, really. But these guys have really spent a ton of time together, at least, you know, Lance and Andy Kotelnicki, the offensive coordinator, and Brian Borland, the defensive coordinator, who spent years together getting back to Wisconsin Whitewater at the Division three level. So, you know, I, I definitely think, you know, do I think Andy's going to stay around forever if he keeps doing as well as he's doing? I, I don't, I doubt it unless he never wants to be a head coach. Sure. Um, but if I, I would lean toward no, I guess at this point, just because I think that he stuck with Lance so long, I don't think he'd just jump just because things start to go well at Kansas. But if he has higher aspirations, like you mentioned, they're going to be people calling and trying to get him. Yeah, for sure. This definitely would not be the time to jump ship. Like you said, just when things are starting to get going, you want to reap those rewards at least for a few years. Uh, and then wait for your good, wait for your opportunity. Okay. Defensively, uh, I noticed Lonnie Phelps seems to be the kid that sticks out besides Kobe Bryant. Uh, but Lonnie Phelps, uh, the edge rusher sixth in the nation with five sacks also has added, uh, seven tackles for loss in total. So, uh, is he the best defensive player? Kobe, or, or, or talk about no Kobe Bryant. He, he, what was his name? Jacoby Bryant last year. Now it's Kobe Bryant. Yeah, now it's Kobe Bryant. He shortened it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think Lonnie has definitely, I think, been the most impactful newcomer for sure. Um, just like you mentioned with the sacks, like Kansas had Kyron Johnson last year, who's now with the Eagles. But it, it really, with Kyron moving on, and they really needed a new pass rusher or someone to step up. And they got Lonnie from Miami, Ohio on the Mac. And he's done nothing but live up to the expectations um, that at least I had for what he could potentially do. Um, at this level. And it's not just with him getting after the quarterback. You'll see him making tackles in the open field too. Um, he, he's a really you know talented player, but like you mentioned, I don't know if Kansas has a bigger big play guy than Kobe Bryant nearly had two interceptions against Iowa state um, came away with one that set up a touchdown drive uh, and had that pick six to beat West Virginia that, you know, all the coaches is wanting to go down, but if he scored the touchdown, you know, no big deal. That's fine. Um, but yeah, those are two big guys. And at the heart of it, Rich Miller, the linebacker, uh, the Mike linebacker spot is definitely also someone um, who's, who's talented as well. Who has the highest pro upside? Ooh, like anywhere on the, on the yeah, on the defense, one, we'll say on defense, oh, on the defense. Oof. Um, I mean, Bryant's young. He's only a, uh, is he a yeah. third year sophomore? I think he's a second year sophomore, but oh. I think he gray shirted. So I think okay. he's a little bit older of a sophomore. I think if I, if I remember that okay. right, but I think Kenny will be the Kenny Logan senior safety will probably be the first one oh, okay. there of that group. Like I don't, I'm not saying he's the biggest pro upside, but he's a senior safety. I think this is going to be his last year at Kansas. Um, although he could use his COVID year somewhere else if he wants to, but I think this is going to be his last year at Kansas. Um, but I, I think he'll be in the pros first. But I mean, if Lonnie keeps playing like he's playing, it's going to be hard to see Lonnie not getting a shot somewhere. Um, I mean, they got a lot of talented linebackers. Maybe Richard Miller's got that future. I don't know. Tywin Berryhill has made such an improvement. Um, but the the pro projecting stuff is a little tougher, but sure. I think Kenny will be there soon. Lonnie definitely has a shot, I would think. And Miller, so he was also a transfer from the Mac. Yeah, from Buffalo, yeah. yeah. Newcomer last I, year. I, I tell you, I love the transfer, and a, a portal. I mean, it, it. I don't like it as much when you see, like, Alabama – you know, winds up getting a, a a top running back from Georgia Tech kind of deal. Oh, they need they need to go out and get more guys, but it helps college football immensely, and it helps. I think it helps with parity, and now you get to see these kids that maybe would have been lost in some smaller conference. They get to play in the big, big, bigger stage, and they also instead of being the third string somewhere, they're starting somewhere. So I love the transfer portal. So, um. Would you say most of the talent in NFL potential talent is on defense? Um, I think it's you know relatively evenly split. I guess okay. in, terms, in terms of how many guys you want to go down just deep. I mean, Jalen's obviously at the quarterback spot. Obviously, risen his um, stature significantly uh, in the last month. Um, Devin Neal, who I mentioned, I think Daniel Highshaw before his injury was getting some buzz. Like not, and these the, the two running backs that I mentioned both have like at least three or something years of eligibility left. So it's not like they would be leaving anytime yeah. soon, but you know, the, so you look at those guys, um, a lot of the guys who are receiving or at the wide receiver spot for Kansas are guys who also have numerous years of 
eligibility yeah. left. They just have a lot of potential. So maybe one of those guys gets a shot like Kwame Laster, who I think is now in the practice squad with the Bengals, um, who was the leading receiver last year. Uh, maybe not draft picks, but guys sure. that make rosters. Um, so I think it's relatively evenly split, okay. and we'll sort of see how things go. But, um, you know, I think Kansas had, a, you know, a couple guys. Obviously, Kyron drafted last year. So I think they'll they'll be guys. I just – not sure who. What about Daniel's actual pro potential? Like what it makes him, because you can be a really good, exciting college quarterback, especially if you're an athlete uh, and you can have a strong arm, but that doesn't translate into the NFL. What do you think Jalen has that might translate to the NFL? Do you think he's, and I'm not trying to sit here and say you're an NFL scout, but just from what you've seen and what you've seen at the pro level, uh, do, do you think he has what it takes two or three years down the line to have that type of uh, ability? I think the progression he's shown, and you mentioned how young he is. I think I think he's like a 19-year-old junior. He was at least a 17-year-old freshman. Okay, wow. Uh, when he was starting as a freshman during that COVID year. Um, so he was he's made such a progression, and he's still so young. So he has so much yes. of a higher ceiling to get to, and he's already playing so well. So like you said, yeah, I'm not, not an NFL scout. I'm not going to try to pretend to be one, but – just how much improvement he's made. It's hard to imagine he can't get even that much better. So he could still start, you know, two more years, I think, uh, of college football. And you have a guy with that much experience. I think that guy's going to get a shot at the pro level. All right. Well, we're definitely going to be watching that. I mean, this is just going to be a, a great story for college football because it's, it's uh, I mean, look, it happened at Kansas State. So I'm sure that's what the fans of Kansas, the longtime fans of Kansas are probably saying. Say, Bill Snyder did it. And and before yeah. Bill Snyder came along, Kansas State was Kansas. So mm-hmm. if, if they can do it, we can do it. I certainly hope Lance Leipold can become the next Bill Snyder and stay there as long as Snyder stayed at Kansas State. I think that'd be great for college football. Uh, fans just absolutely loving it, having a party every day. Right. It's it's such a different atmosphere than it was last year. Like last year, I came into it thinking, you know, a team on a rebuild. It's going to be tough at times, and it definitely was. That was your first you know, not, year last year. Yep, that was my first year covering the team last year, so definitely not packed stadiums. And then all of a sudden, second home game this year, they're sold out. Third home game this year, they're sold out again. So, And I'm sure with college game day coming on Saturday, <laughs> it'll be sold out again. So it's, it, is, it is eye-opening how quickly a program can be turned around and just how much this fan base, I think, Leipold used the word starving. I think this fan base was definitely starving for something like this after what the last decade was. Yeah. Uh, no quite. Mangino was really the last that those are the yeah. good old days if you want to, you know, yeah. as good as it was. Uh, all right. So the game this week, TCU and the schedule gets tough before the bye. It's TCU at Oklahoma at Baylor. Uh, I, I thought that when we did our Big 12 preseason preview show, I kind of really felt with Lincoln Riley gone and, and taking some of those Oklahoma players and say, you know what? I get the feeling that these teams are going to beat up each other and that I couldn't I wouldn't be surprised if the Big 12 championship game had both teams had two losses. And I can still see that. Uh, I just think that that's what you're going to get. I mean, do you believe that? Because the, the, the two teams playing this weekend, Kansas and TCU, are like – playing just as good as any two teams in the conference right now. Yeah, I think heading into the season, I thought Texas would make a big jump. I, at least I thought. Um, and then I, I think I picked, I'm trying to remember exactly what uh, my preseason prediction was, but I think I thought Oklahoma State was going to lead it. That I think I thought Baylor was going to be pretty good. But I just, I didn't think Oklahoma would drop off seemingly to the level that it has from what it was capable of. So yeah, it's definitely seems like a conference where people are going to beat up on each other. And like you mentioned, this is definitely a tough stretch coming up for Kansas, uh, at least just because Oklahoma and Baylor are on the road. Yeah. And that's just not going to be easy places to go play. Yeah, and, and what, what happened last week as far as the offense? And because Iowa State's a good defense, but they're not, as far as I know, they're not elite, but maybe they are. I don't know. But what happened? Why do you think they were bogged down so much uh, offensively? Yeah, I think first off, Jalen just didn't have his best day. And this this offense really does rely on him a lot to make the right reads, to make the right decisions, whether that's making the first read in the progression or going through it and getting um, to one of the later ones. Just didn't make enough of those. And then when those plays were there, they had some that just came up just short. Like there was a long touchdown pass to Quinn Skinner that was nearly caught but didn't. There was a huge first down conversion on one play that was taken back because of a holding penalty. Like plays that they didn't have not go their way uh, in, in past weeks that – uh, didn't go their way this week and then stop drives and 
and like you mentioned, Iowa State's already a great defense. So if you get those opportunities and don't take them, you're in for a tough day. And that's just sort of what happened. And then second half, they just got too conservative. Um, and that's sort of what they wanted to do with how the game was going. But um, I think you, you'll talk to a lot of people who think they should have tried to go for it more than they did. Um, not necessarily on fourth down, but really sure, just go sure. for it uh, in terms of where they didn't. And that sort of just all compounded into, you know, a 14 point. Yeah, and that's, a, that's the maturation of, of, a, of a rebuild too, is, is, is now you get into the point where like those lines, all you have to do is look at the lines each week and they're shrinking and they're shrinking. And uh, even though I thought they should have been maybe a pick em or, or leaving a, a slight favorite last week, I was like, no respect. Mm-hmm. I understood why they were still a dog. Um, uh, they have to earn it. Uh, Mark Lawrence, uh, who handicaps our games, even said that last week. Hey, you got to earn it. And it, it, we'll find out whether or not. And, and I think I'm not really uh, annoyed, I guess is the right word, or uh, discouraged regarding the line this week because it's five points against TCU. And I understand what TCU is doing. I mean, they're for real, especially offensively. I mean, that quarterback, you talk about Daniels. I mean, that's going to be a hell of a matchup between those two guys. So, uh, I, you know, this is no question, uh, a big, even a bigger step up for Kansas. Uh, but I think TCU is more vulnerable defensively than Iowa State. So you would expect like a game maybe even in the 30s on Saturday? Yeah, and then, I mean, potentially more. I guess it's a matter of, you know, it is this defensive effort from Kansas, which was arguably the best it's had since Leipold and Borland have, have taken over. And Lawrence, is this de- is that defensive effort going to be sustained or not? If they're going to revert back to what they have been in, in recent weeks, then yeah, you could see a shootout in, in in Lawrence on Saturday, which you know I guess would be probably good for College Game Day. I, don't know, I guess they would probably want points yeah. uh, for the game that they're moving sure. to. Yeah, you don't but, want fourteen to you know, eleven. No. The, the, yeah, the the potential for a shootout is definitely there, um, but you know I don't think people saw fourteen eleven coming this past week. That's so true. we'll see what yeah. happens. Uh, by the way, Leipold, 25-9 and nine against the spread as an FBS head coach at home. 2-0 and o this year. That's pretty uh, – yeah. Pretty good. And TCU and Kansas are combined 9-0 and o straight up, 7-0 and o against the spread this year. So something has to give. Something. Something has to give. Something yeah, because there's no ties in college football like there are in the NFL. Uh, Jordan, I appreciate it. I hope this is the first of many opportunities. At, well, I'll keep our fingers crossed that uh, Lance stays long term because if he does, there's going to be a lot of winning football for Kansas uh, for sure. years to come. And I think that's awesome. Uh, you cover the basketball team as well? Yeah. Yeah. I think focus on men's basketball and football, but, you know, definitely cover the other sports. And do you have your own show, podcast, something like that, that uh, the the viewers can follow? Ooh, not a big podcast guy myself in terms of having my own, but, you know, I I got, you can go to the Topeka Captain Arnold's website and read all about it, subscribe to the premium paper too. But yeah, online and in print, you can see my stuff. Awesome. Jordan, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good luck on Saturday. I'm sure this, the, the, the atmosphere is going to be incredible. So, uh, soak it all in, man, and uh, I'll hopefully talk to you later in the season. I appreciate it, man. You Thank you. It.